Thanks for joining us. I'm Steve Shu, And I'm Corey Washington, and we're your hosts for Manifold. Uh, our guest today is Ted Chang. He is one of my favorite science fiction writers and also one of Corey's. His work has won, I, I'm now reading from his Wikipedia entry, which I hope is accurate, four Nebula Awards and four Hugo Awards. And his short story, Story of Your Life, was the basis for the, the film Arrival, which, was, uh, which appeared in 2016. So welcome to our show, Ted. Thank you very much. Now, in uh, setting up the outline for the show, Ted and I corresponded a bit, and I had originally proposed all kinds of sort of standard questions about writing and literary stuff, and Ted sort of responded that he gets these questions all the time, but I think he doesn't get to talk to a theoretical physicist and a neuroscientist slash uh, philosopher, which is what Corey is, uh, that often, and so he wanted to perhaps focus the discussion more on topics uh, germane to those areas. So a lot of the things we're going to discuss today actually involve uh, fundamental concepts in physics and science and also in philosophy. That's what, that's, yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. Great. And I, we're looking forward to it, too, because we, I, at least my opinion is you're one of the best in the business in writing uh, about the deep conceptual side of all these issues and, and making it into entertaining fiction. So let me start with uh, an observation about something called hard science fiction, which is a kind of subgenre of science fiction. And the way I often describe hard science fiction is that it's one in which they really get into the technical detail and try to get those details right. But it's often from more of what I would call an engineering kind of focus, where they really are interested in, like, how does the actual rocket engine work or the sensor array uh, for the spaceship? And The way I kind of think about your style is that, uh, in your case, what you're really striving for is a very deep internal scientific consistency of the ideas that are uh, central to the story. And oftentimes, this internal scientific consistency is hidden from the casual reader. I think the casual reader who's not a scientist wouldn't really even notice that that's going on. But for an actual scientist like me, it's very striking because I read your stories and I just sense that you've thought through the underlying assumptions and the underlying science very, very carefully and deeply. And so I never detect, as far as I know, inconsistencies in the stru- inter- even in the internal structure of your stories. So maybe you can comment on this perception of your fiction. Well, okay, so the definition of hard science fiction is something that is subject to endless debate. People will argue just ad infinitum about uh, what is the proper definition of hard science fiction? The type of fiction that you're describing that uh, has a focus on the engineering side of things, on getting the delta V right for a, a vehicle traveling, you know, uh, between the Earth and the Moon, or you know, the Earth and Mars. You know, that is that is a a type of hard science fiction. That is what some people would think of as being true hard science fiction. And, 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 and I should say, I definitely respect and admire that type of fiction. I myself, I am interested in my own writing. I'm interested more in, I guess, sort of the broader theoretical or philosophical side of things. And I guess one of the things that I've said about hard science fiction and science is that in the same way that science itself can be understood as maybe not so much as a as a collection of facts, but as a way of looking at the universe, a way of approaching the universe, a way of understanding the universe. Because you know, the, that's the specific collection of facts, that will change over time. But the underlying approach remains the same. There's a certain scientific mindset, a worldview, uh, which I think is, that is perhaps the true essence of science as in human endeavor. I think that Another way of thinking about science fiction and hard science fiction is fiction which, you know, it may or may not conform to a specific, you know, collection of facts, but it embodies the scientific mindset, the scientific worldview. It tries to represent how scientists think about the universe, how they understand the universe to work. And that is something that I'm interested in. I mean, I, when you talk about the fact that you're interested in the philosophical kind of foundation implications, that's what really came through very strongly in your writing. You know, we talk about particular examples such as 
you know, I, I, when I'm reading Exhale, I'm really thinking a lot about Cheryl's Chinese Room uh, example, often from the flip side of it. And I'm seeing your engagement with issues of free will. I, I guess I want to disagree a little bit because your perspective seems very much a kind of merging of philosophy and science in a way I think is very positive, but I think has actually been lost in a lot of modern science. I've been struck by how non-philosophical science has become, especially things like neuroscience, whereas I think many great scientists, many traditional scientists before the split came, really saw these issues as deeply intertwined, and they become more separate uh, in the modern era. So I guess I, 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 I guess have your reaction to the combination of science and philosophy. Is that at the heart of your writing, and do you see yourself as someone engaged in a kind of more, uh, I guess I say, a more, an older, more traditional, an older tradition that saw these two things as really the flip sides of a given coin? That's a that's that's an interesting perspective, I guess. You know, and that may be a reflection of the fact that you know I am not actually a working scientist, so I am not out there in the trenches on a day to day basis. Uh, so I have not been subject to perhaps the intense specialization and narrow focus uh, maybe working scientists have to deal with. So I can take a maybe broader view of science than someone who is actually having to like, you know, write up grant applications. So, you know, in that sense, yes, it may be that my, my view of science is a, a somewhat older one where science and scientists are participating in a kind of a tradition of, you know, to some extent, philosophical inquiry about the universe. That is definitely the sort of thing that I am most interested in. Yeah, I, I, and I can't say how much that is in the forefront of the minds of people who are actually working in science right now. Yeah, I think to Corey's point, there are a lot, there are large parts of science in which uh, you might call sort of normal science, where you're not making a revolutionary discovery, but you're making some incremental progress, like measuring some parameter to more accuracy or measuring some fact about some organism. But it doesn't change our overall kind of philosophical worldview or the way that we regard nature or our, loca our location in the universe, our role in nature. But I, my sense is the interesting aspects that you choose to illuminate in your stories are often ones which get to the philosophical heart of what science tells us. I suppose in some ways, if you're going to tell a story, if you're going to write a story about, say, journalism, to some extent, you could focus on the really nitty gritty details of journalistic practice. But I think it's probably true that you know, if you're going to write a story about journalists, you're also going to have the story reflect some, th something about like the reasons why journalism matters, why people go into journalism, what is the purpose of journalism, which is something which you know, journalists may not actually you know, be wrestling with on a day-to-day -day basis. On a day-to-day -day basis, they're wrestling with much more mundane, nitty gritty things. But yeah, if you're telling a story about journalism, about you know, the pursuit of journalism, then you will probably try and bring in the broader themes, the reasons why people go into journalism in the first place. It is a, perhaps a more you know, idealized version, but still reflects a, a fundamental truth about journalism. And so in the same way that if you're writing about scientists, you could write about the day-to-day, -day, you know, nitty-gritty work of being a scientist and trying to trying to get your grant application approved or you know dealing with departmental politics or you know requisitioning equipment and things like that, all of which are important parts of the lives of scientists. For one thing, you know, I don't I don't know I don't know a lot about that side of things. So I'm not going to write about that. I'm not the right person to write about uh, that sort of thing. As someone who is not a working scientist, I am interested in, I guess, you know, the ideals of science as a pursuit. What does the pursuit of, uh, of science represent? What is that about? Those are the things that I'm interested in and try to write about. Let me mention another aspect of your style and and hear what you have to think about uh, what you think about it. I sort of sense that you have a fully worked out view of the world in a particular story that you're writing about, and that you've sort of worked out 
the way things work scientifically, the natural laws and their implications in that world. And that is why perhaps a reader like me senses an internal consistency in the world that you're creating. One of the people that you're often compared to, uh, Borges, who also wrote short stories, which also contain some kind of speculative or imaginative component, oftentimes when I read his stories, it's not clear at all to me that he has fully fleshed out the working rules of the world that he's sketching in the story. And so to me, that's, that's an important difference between you and Borges. So can you, can you comment a little bit about your thoughts about the working out the full internal consistency of the worlds in which you set your stories? I, I guess I sort of think that that may have to do with uh, the fact that I came out of a science fiction tradition, whereas Borges did not. Borges, who is, you know, I think undoubtedly a genius, but he did not write for an audience of science fiction readers. You know, I, he did not come out of a, a tradition of reading, you know, sort of genre science fiction. So his concerns are not exactly those of science fiction writers or readers. So, so the, you know, the question of is the, is the universe of the story you know, completely worked out in detail? Is it really internally consistent? You know, I think you know, that, that's not something which is of enormous interest to Borges. He fleshes things out enough to you know, evoke a universe. And you know, as long as it, the details are, are sufficient to sort of convey the ideas that he is trying to convey, then you know, that's all the story needs. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And it's no fault of Borges. I mean, he wasn't, as you say, trying to do exactly the same kind of thing that you're doing. But, but sometimes people, like even scientists or mathematicians, will point to a Borges short story and say, see, he really illustrates the meaning of infinity or something or recursion in this story. But I often feel like your stories do a better job uh, of illustrating a specific concept be- because of the extra detail and extra consistency that you impose. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to co- claim that <laughs> my stories can compare to Borges's in any way. So I'm glancing over at Steve's notes here, and um, he's preparing to ask you about uh, free will. And there are a couple of stories in your new collection that touch on free will. So don't, if you mind, if we get a little bit specific, because I'm, I'm really kind of fascinated by um, the science behind these stories. So in What's Expected of Us, you discuss a device called Predictor, uh, which uh, will flash a signal about a second or so before a person makes a decision. And uh, as you flesh out, you really can't do anything about this signal, right? If you try to jump the gun, the predictor will get there a second before you uh, perform an action, make a decision. If you try to trick it by waiting, it doesn't actually light up. Now, I, 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 when I'm reading this, I'm thinking about Libet's experiments from the night from 1983, where he showed that there is a, I think it was a, an fMRI signal, or um, which happens roughly a second before we make decisions. This had an enormous impact on philosophy when this result came out. Because I think many people uh, drew the same conclusion you did, which is, and maybe this is also quite obvious from simple understanding of uh, conventional physics, that our lives are largely determined, and the appearance or impression we have of free will is, in fact, illusory. Your brain has essentially made a decision before you've actually become consciously aware of that. And uh, as you uh, play this out, I, I first of all, I'd like to get your reaction to it. Uh, was this, in fact... Were you moved by Libet's experiments when you began to think about the story? Actually, no. I am not that. I'm not that impressed by Libet's findings. I mean, they are certainly interesting findings, but I don't think they say anything substantive about free will. I think all they do is uh, show that there are there are certain you know there's a certain type of brain activity that precedes your conscious you know decision making. But I don't think that that materially changes anything about the discussion of free will. All, all it says is that decision making is a neural process which doesn't happen in the very moment. It's something which you know is sort of built up to. But I think that you know all the all all the arguments pro or con free will can still be made irrespective of Libet's results. But isn't one of the main at least you might not call it an argument for free will, but it's the 
it's a sense the argument from the feeling, right? We feel like we are making these decisions at a certain moment, and that may not be an actual argument for free will, but probably explains why many of us think we have it. And you don't think that these results call into question whether this experience is indicative of free will, given that the signal comes before you have any conscious experience of making the decision? You know, it, it's, it's only like a second that, that Libet found, you know, that this, this neural activity was happening before you, you actually, you know, made, made a physical action. I don't think that that is that significant. I think, you know, our conscious perception of our decision-making process is not that fine-grained in its temporal resolution. So the fact that you felt it happen at nine seconds past the, past the minute, and you know, it was actually happening eight seconds past the minute, I, I, I don't think that's a big deal. I, I think the issue Corey's raising is that the feeling that you made the decision at a particular moment that your conscious brain has of making the decision or coming to the conclusion might itself be an illusion, and that might be illustrated by these experiments, because actually the decision was made maybe a second before, but you didn't know it. Your conscious brain didn't know it. And I think that that's about all you can get from living. That, yeah, right? that's Is kind that, of what I'm yeah, getting at. Yeah. But so I'm, I'm kind of thinking about your story, right? Because you're, I think, drawing out the consequence that the predictor effectively gives you this signal in the outside world, right? In an LED, in an LED form. And people f find this incredibly unsettling. Uh, you rightly observe. So let me, just for our audience, maybe say something about the story. So it's a very short story. It's, I think it's beautifully done. It's, it's actually my favorite story of yours, Ted. And um, in the story, someone is given a bracelet, and the, when the light flashes, it indicates that you'll then push the button on the bracelet. Is it, what's the lag, three seconds or some number of seconds later, right? There are sort of two ways you could think about it. Your interpretation, Corey, is one that I didn't really think of, which is that perhaps the bracelet is monitoring your brain, and it knows you've made a decision, and then it flashes to show the decision has been made, and then since you made the decision, then you push the button. I had always interpreted it, I think, which is the way that, Corey des uh, that Ted describes it in the story, is that there is what we physicists would call a closed time-like curve, which connects uh, the bracelet at one time to the bracelet at an earlier time. And so what happens is when you press the button, it sends a message backwards in time, which causes in the past the light to go off. And so the light having gone off means that the message was sent, which means that you did in fact push the button three seconds later. And so it's a, to me, an amazing illustration like with all the right psychological imp imp implications and things like that of what it would be like for a human to interact with a closed time light curve. And it's brilliant also because the, the, the time difference between the, the sending of the message and the light going off is short enough that it has kind of a very strong psychological impact. Well, yes, Steve's, Steve's reading of the story is, is correct because I, I, I think the story makes it clear that it is not monitoring any, any neural behavior, any neural phenomena. It's a circuit with a negative time delay. So it is a closed time-like curve on, on a logic board, it's a it's a, it's a closed time like curve on a logic board. So, yes, it is sending a signal back in time, and because of that, it's not something that you can trick by, say, removing it from a person. You know, like you can if you if you try and build a device, something use it, like using one of those little, those drinking bird death toys. If you try and build something like that, that will hit the button you will not be able to trick the device because it is precisely the fact that the button gets pushed that sends the signal back in time and causes the, the LED to, to light up. So it, it is, is not a, a version of Libet's experiment. It is something which is, is more a demonstration of something that uh, relativistic physics discusses. Yeah, and I think one of our topics, the next topic has to do with varieties of time travel, and a certain variety of time travel is illustrated in the story, and so I want to get to that in a second. But before we get to that, I want to continue talking about free will a little bit. And so the physicist's view of free will is the following. So in physics, we, at least uh, in classical physics, and this is modified a little bit in quantum mechanics, but in classical physics, the idea is 
if you know the positions and the velocities of all the molecules at time t equals zero, you can perfectly predict the positions and velocities of those uh, molecules or atoms, whatever they are, particles, at some later time, say t equals one second. In conventional physics. In conventional physics. And that was a dream of the early physicists that this could be true. And early mechanics and studies of motion seem to indicate that actually the equations were simple enough that you could, they were totally deterministic. The state of the system at t equals zero totally determines the state of the system at t equals one, t equals two. Now, if that's true, then the question arose, what room is there for free will? So in other words, if the state of the entire universe were to be known at time t equals zero, then we know the state at all future times because we can just follow the equations forward. And then the argument would go, the only thing that could be left is the illusion of free will. So you don't know that the decision you will make about what to have for lunch was already determined by the state of your stomach and your glands and the picture of the chicken that you were shown on TV that morning, but it was actually determined. And you have only the illusion of making a choice, but the choice was determined. So I think that's the common sense interpretation, but you know, philosophers often argue for things that are not commonsensical. And so it's a huge literature on what's called compatibilism. Right. And I, I think Ted is a fan, perhaps, of compatibilism. Compatibilism. Am I right about that, Ted? Yes. Yes, yeah. I am. So I've always had trouble understanding what people mean when they say <laughs> compatibilism. So I think you want, you're saying that compatibilism is not the same thing as observing that we have merely the illusion of free will. Is that? Yes, I think. It, I mean, I'm not an expert in this type of metaphysics, but as far as I know, people really want to say that there's can be a robust concept of free will that's fully consistent with a deterministic universe and... Again, I, I, I'm a very far removed from this literature, but as far as I understand, that's what kind of robust philosophical compatibilism holds. It's not just an illusion of free will. It's not just an epiphenomenon. It's actually something that's somehow consistent with fully deterministic universe. Ted, where in the perspective of compatibilism does your position lie? I am a compatibilist. So I guess my my stance is largely uh, based on, I guess, uh, Daniel Dennett's arguments in favor of compatibilism. So I guess the way I would phrase it is that, what is it that you want from free will that, that you are not getting? You know, if you try and nail down what it is that people want from free will, what they, you know, when, they, when they use that phrase, what do they want from that? And what is it that they are not getting? It seems to me that uh, like some, naively people want the, they want the future to be completely unknown in that, that there is no, there is no future. So there's a future where they choose option A and there's a future where they choose option B and they are both potentialities. And only when they make that decision does one actually obtain and the other one ceases to, to be a possibility. The way I, I think about it is that, so they're, they're imagining, you know, that there are these sort of two scenarios. In the scenario where they choose option A and the scenario where they choose option B, the entire history of the universe, every, you know, the position and velocity of every atom was exactly the same up until the moment that they made their decision. And in one case, they made, they chose option A, and then the other case, they chose option B. And if that's what they want from free will, it's like, yeah, I, I don't think that's a really that's that's something that is something meaningful. That's not something w that they actually want because that that's that scenario means that their choice of option A or option B depended on absolutely nothing that happened in the entire history of the universe prior to that point. It cannot have depended on it because they're exactly the same in both cases. So that 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 means choosing option A and option B was essentially a kind of a quantum coin flip. And I don't think that's what people actually want. That's, that's, that's no kind of decision at all. What if someone says, my, my deep suspicion is people who really want free will are kind of dualists. They think there's yes, another, yes. there's a parallel level to the universe, which is not yes. physically determined. And their choice comes from this other layer of kind of consciousness, mind, and that can intervene in the physical world and drop down. And that's what has the cause, that's what causes the universe to go towards option A or option B. 
It's that causation of mind or consciousness that constitutes free will and is not part of the previous physical structure of the universe. Yes. They, they are looking for a kind of dualism, even if they might not express it that way. They uh, are looking for a kind of immaterial soul. Although, again, I think most of them would rather not phrase it that way. Th then there's a the question of like, how does this immaterial soul, how does it work? Not, and I don't mean like in a detailed physical sense, because it's, it's obviously non-physical, but when we think about what we want from free will, you know, we want to, I think to some extent, we want to deserve credit for the good decisions we make and deserve the blame for the bad decisions we make. And some of that will arise out of our process of deliberation. The factors that go into our process of deliberation are everything that we have experienced in our life. So those are all physical things. Everything that, that happened to you in your life, those were all physical things. So the process of deliberation by which you sort of are, roughly speaking, taking all the experiences of your life as inputs, and then you know, one of the outputs is your decision between option A and option B, that is something which I believe that is entirely compatible with a materialist, physicalist uh, universe. And I think a materialist, physicalist universe provides you with what you want because your, your decision is the result of your life experience being processed through your cognition. That is what you want from free will. And I think that is what compatibilism, what a, what a materialist universe actually gives you. So based on that definition of compatibilism, I don't object to it, but I, I would assert that to me, it sounds very similar to the notion that we have the illusion of free will, but nevertheless may live in a deterministic universe. See, I guess I don't know why it's an illusion versus the reality. Yeah. So that comes down to defining what, it, yeah, what one means by free will, of course. I, I just think that deeply embedded in the concept of free will is the fact that I can sit here... And regardless of my past history, regardless of the entire state of every atom in the universe, by willing something, I can change the course yes. so, of so, my life right. and thus everything else. Right. So, so, so that is a decent definition of free will, the one that you just gave. And then if that's your definition, then I say you only have the illusion of that kind of free will. It's an illusion. You don't actually have that kind of free will. I'm I'm generally sympathetic to determinism, but I'd, I'd step back and say, well, but this feeling is so strong, and it's so hard to predict. Powerful illusion. Okay, but it's so hard to predict the course of where I'm going to move my hand, given our current physics. Nothing in our current physics is going to be able to allow you yes, now in, or for the foreseeable future. In, in practice, you're right. Uh, the other way to view it is that your consciousness, your sense of self is this ephemeral, fragile little bubble floating on the surface of this deep ocean. And of course, it doesn't know where you're going to move your hand. It's possible, but there's a f strong feeling that it's there. And the question is, do you want to override this feel? Do you want to allow our c current scientific understanding of the world, which we all know is incomplete, this whole list of things we don't understand about nature, we don't understand dark matter, we don't understand the origin of the universe, all these things we don't understand, this incomplete picture of nature can allow this to override this incredibly strong feeling. Right, so you have this intuition, which may be evolutionary, there, evolution required you to have of making decisions and free will, and uh, our science is complete, and in fact, we may eventually discover a small ethereal tether which goes out the back of your head into this parallel universe where somehow there are not causes for outcomes, uh, and the decision is really made there. That, that's what you're kind of groping for with this dualist. I'd say, or I'd say that our current science seems to have two basic paradigms. One is pure determinism, and the other is stochastics of quantum mechanics, right? Those seem to be the alternatives. It's either purely determined, or it's random in some kind of distribution. And I think what Free wants, wants to say, there's something in between those two poles. Uh, and we may not kind of understand how you get there, but like the world's not purely random, and it's not purely deterministic, and we don't quite know how that's going to become compatible with our current physics. Yeah, um, I, I, think, I, I think I agree with what you're saying. Let's, uh, because we're, we don't have that much time, let's go on to our next topic, which is varieties of time travel. 
And so in the story that we just discussed, we encountered one variety of time travel. For lack of a better word, I'll call that the consistent one-time uh, version of the structure of, of, of time. So in other words, what you did when you pushed the button and sent the signal back in time to cause the LED to go off, no matter what uh, transpires subsequent to the light going off, it must be something which is consistent with the fact that you then later push the button. And one of my former PhD students is a huge aficionado of this kind of science fiction. He's always searching for really complex sci-fi stories and movies where they've perfectly realized this kind of universe, and all the facts are consistent, but there's only one timeline, and it was unav all the events that happened were essentially unavoidable. Uh, this goes back to free will a little bit, unavoidable on that timeline. So I think he claims 12 Monkeys. There's a science fiction movie called 12 Monkeys, Yeah, I think. it's a Brad Pitt movie, is that yes, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And he claims that that's a very well-realized version of this kind of uh, structure of time. And uh, let maybe we can ask Ted how he feels about it and whether he's ever written stories realizing another version of time travel, maybe time travel between different parallel universes. Well, I, I agree that 12 Monkeys is, is a movie that poses a single fixed timeline. And I think 12 Monkeys does a pretty good job of it. Also, as another example, the first Terminator film is an example of this. The second Terminator film is not, but the first Terminator film does posit a, um, a fixed timeline. And you know, this is something that I'm interested in. And you know, there's a sense in which what's expected of us falls into this category. Also the story, uh, The Merchant and the Alchemist Gate falls in this category. There's even a sense in which, for my first collection, a story of your life falls in this category. As for a time travel story which posits alternate or parallel timelines, I, I think the closest I come to that is the final story in the new collection, which is called Anxiety is the Dizziness of Freedom. Well, it's, it's basically sort of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. So it's not exactly the it's not exactly the branching timelines created by time travelers, which we sometimes see in time travel stories, but it is similar to it in in some ways. I really like the story, The Merchant and the Alchemist Gate. In that story, you're dealing with a deterministic past. You know you can't change things, so you're highly constrained. Yes, it is constraining. My inspiration, in large part, came from hearing Kip Thorne talk about how one could actually construct a closed time-like curve. And Kip Thorne had, you know, he actually set up a, a thought experiment involving billiard balls where, you know, he tried to imagine could a billiard ball knock itself off course and create sort of the billiard ball version of the grandfather paradox. And when he, you know, solved those equations, he said, no, you can't. There's only a consistent timeline possible. I was interested in trying to imagine what that might be like in human dramatic terms and stories in which there's a fixed timeline, stories in which it is impossible to change the past, like 12 Monkeys, they are usually downbeat stories. There's, a, you know, there's definitely a tradition of this in science fiction and they're usually kind of depressing. They, they end on a note of despair. 12 Monkeys certainly does and arguably Terminator does as well. And so what I was trying to do is to see if it was possible to write a story about a, a single fixed timeline which didn't end on a downbeat note. And so that was really sort of the animating impulse for Merchant and the Alchemist Gate. I, I think in a universe where that kind of time travel is possible, it, one would be very happy because historians could actually do their job. They could actually go back and make sure they really understood what happened in the past, otherwise kind of impossible to do that. Just a comment on the Kip Thorne uh, thought experiment. So Kip Thorne for the movie, I think for, for, for the, maybe for the book that Carl Sagan wrote, Contact, wanted to design a kind of realistic mechanism for uh, interstellar travel. And so he came up with the idea of building a wormhole and pulling uh, the ends in a certain way so that the two ends ended up at different times. And one of the things that I've actually done research on is it turns out in order to stabilize a wormhole in general relativity, so a wormhole is a very special thing in space-time, 
it turns out you need matter with a very unusual equation of state, with a very, very unusual properties. And there's an open question as to whether such materials could ever exist in the universe. And now there's very strong evidence uh, from theoretical calculations that such matter cannot be stable. It cannot actually exist. And so it may be that this particular way of making a time machine is not possible. Now, when he was looking at this, this was not known. And so he was interested in questions of whether the laws of physics, given the existence of this kind of closed time-like curve, would the laws of physics otherwise conspire to keep things consistent? so that the, the billiard ball could not go back in time and knock itself out of the way before it entered the wormhole. And so that, that's, the I guess, the motivation originally for Ted. Kip Thorne was, um, he was author with Wheeler of this very large textbook, Gravitation, yes. which I remember reading yes. as an undergraduate. And it was kind of a, the Bible of general relativity for quite a while. Yes. I had no idea he was behind, uh, involved in, in contact. Yeah, it was actually because of science fiction that he kind of got pushed, because Carl Sagan was writing a science fiction novel that he asked Kip about this question, and that pushed Kip's research direction in, in that way. So um, it's quite interesting. In, in a way, it's a little bit, because I worked on this, I know, it's a little bit disreputable in physics. Like, people are asking you, why are you working on this problem? And or stability, in my case, like stability of matter that violates the null energy condition. That was like something I worked on for a while. And I would just say, well, it's an intrinsically interesting question whether matter like this can exist and it has these implications for time travel. But I think most physicists thought, Steve, you should go and think about the top quark instead or something. <laughs> they thought it was just too far out. Yeah, just the motivation. I thought it was very strange because as a physicist, like, why did we get into physics? We got into physics to actually understand things like this. Like, do the laws of physics as we currently understand them allow for the construction of a time machine or a closed time-like curve? And uh, so it seems like the most important thing that you should be thinking about as a physicist, but you know how things work. In science, you know, the NSF doesn't give the grant for that. The NSF gives a grant for trying to make a slightly better superconductor or a slightly stiffer, you know, electromagnet or something like that. So it becomes a kind of an unusual activity. It seems to me there's a progression throughout the book. And when you get to the last story... You bring these two topics together, the deterministic timeline and also free will, um, when you get to the, the story about anxiety. Anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. Yeah. And it, was, that, was, that, was that an explicit motivation? Because people in this story agonize about their ability to affect the future. Often when they see when their, their para self has done better than they have, they wonder if they've done something wrong and they're often reminded that you actually, that it's nothing they did that resulted in their in their current lives being good or bad. But at the same time, there's a, so there's emphasis on the fact that you, there is determinism, uh, there may not be free will, and kind of playing out the consequence of this. In this story, I thought it was very interesting because one of the central assumptions of the story is that we can be envious of ourselves, which I thought was fascinating because you normally we think of it as something involved in other people, but of course, if they're parallel universes, you have all these kind of psychological reactions. And a lot of the story is built around this really human reaction to seeing yourself as something other existing in this parallel universe. I never really come across that concept before, and I'm wondering, had you before, or is this something you thought about when you first developed this, what our reaction would be to ourselves? It certainly has come up in science fiction before of meeting your parallel self not not in the context of written science fiction, but there have been some some movies which address this question. There's a movie called, um, I think it's called The Family Man, starring Nicolas Cage, in which he gets a chance to see what his life would have been like had he made it, a decision uh, many years ago differently. There was a, an Australian film called Me, Myself, I, starring Rachel Griffith, in which she also gets to see what her life would have been like had she made a different choice. I think you know, it's a very human question about wondering, did I make the right choice? Would my life have gone better if I had done something differently in the past? And if you could actually see it, then I think it would be people would be very prone to envy. Because I think people are prone to envy just because they are just, that's, I think that's a natural human tendency. And so I think if you could actually see the life that you might have lived, I think people probably would often be envious of that. So maybe you know this movie. It used to be the most famous Christmas movie. It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. And I think he spends the whole time contemplating. He regrets his choices in life 
and then has a near-death experience, and he, he gets to see what the world would have been like if he had died or if he had done something differently, and it's a much worse world. So he, he then appreciates all the contributions he had made to the world with the choices that he made. I'm surprised at your reaction to this, Corey, because as somebody who almost left physics, for example, to go work at a hedge fund, I constantly think, man, what would my life be like if I had gone off and done that? And have given all the things you've done in your life, I'm surprised you don't wonder. No, no I don't have it. I have to say this story created enormous anxiety in me. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually combined with another story, your life log, because the life log story shows you can actually look back and see very objectively, in some sense objectively, from a certain perspective, the mistakes you've made. By the way, this is the story which posits that people could have perfect memory and then look back at all the events in their lives with perfect clarity. Is that... Yeah, exactly. And what's, it's funny, this is a slight digression, but what struck me about your collection is you explore different kinds of technologies, and some are fairly far out, like the prism, which may never happen, may happen in thousands of years. Some are on the verge of happening right now, and I think people are already life-logging their kids. And I have really no doubt that in a decade or two, life-logging will be a very, very common phenomenon. So all the implications that come from that story are things we have to grapple with. You'll be able to look back and see the things that you did and often resolve questions and give you actually falsify your view of your previous life, which often is rose-colored. So that was a struggle. But I think that gives a great opportunity to begin to agonize about things that you did that may have led you on a particular course, and that's drawn out in the anxiety story because yeah. you can— I- Lucky you that you've reached your age and you don't, you didn't previously agonize about. I agonize all the time no, about this. Stuff. No, no, no I, I, I can't say this is the first time I've agonized about it, right? But this, this, it, it, it made me especially uncomfortable because you do then go back and run back in the choice you've made. Like this isn't to spend all the years in philosophy that I spent. I mean, I think about that regularly. But think of all the thoughts on compatibilism that you've had thanks to your that's right. That's training. Right, that's a great benefit to me. <laughs> so anyway, I, it's. it's I mean, this, this is the sense why I see the collections really building, because there are a bunch of building blocks that go in at various stages in the collection. And I don't know if this was intentional, but it, a lot of the stories seem to be building up to the story and anxiety. And the, the, the idea of life locking is, I think, again, something that strikes me as a... You know, Steve and I talk a lot about technologies that are on the horizon. Uh, we could hope they'll get to your New York Times op-ed before we finish. Um, but genomic engineering of children, uh, we think, is coming very, very soon. And life logging strikes me as something that's here and going to become much more common. I think about it with my kids. My wife recently proposed that we, because you have these great events, little moments happen with your kids, and you just don't have a camera ready. Or you pull up the camera and the kid reacts differently. She wanted to buy a little drone to basically have hover around our kids yeah. so you capture things constantly. <laughs> or just mount it on the wall of your house. Yeah, but you, but you also want to get, like, so they're traveling That's when the true. kids, you know, yeah. here or there. Um, and so, like, if we're thinking about this now and it's feasible and it's so attractive, um, it's going to happen, which means a lot of the implications about you will, you'll be able to resolve arguments as to what, was, what happened before. And this, of course, is, you know, to some extent exists... Uh, as Ted brings out in the story through simple writing of writing down what happened, but it's going to be much more radical, and it will, in fact, get at... Uh, so what I like about the story also is that you brought in cognitive science about the difference between episodic and semantic memory, and we actually had to some extent records of sort of facts uh, through writing and to some extent events, but this will bring in... This will radically change our experience of episodic memory because it'll give us much more kind of objective view of, of events. Um, but it's just something that that is going to really draw out the ability to regret <laughs> actions that push you in. So I, I, I feel we direction. should. I feel we should let Ted talk more. But I can't resist saying that neuroscience studies suggest that we only convert about one bit of information per second into long term memory. So basically, almost all of your past is lost to you. And so I've taken to just when I'm traveling around, just pulling out my phone and just taking like 30 seconds of video because it's still enormously more information that I otherwise would have about, you know, that moment visiting San Francisco or whatever I was doing. But most of the past is completely lost. It, it, it's interesting. It's, it is completely lost. Although the strike is it's often retained in some vague form. So if you see a picture, you can, of course, it will remind you of something you can't actually consciously yes. recall. Which is a good reason to be constantly taking video and photos of your kids and other stuff. Or right? having a drone up above Or your having head. a drone. Yeah, we need drones. Anyway, Ted said, sorry, we've <laughs> <laughs> had a discussion of your own work. Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be debatable whether you actually will be better off 
with the constant drone footage of your kids because people say that like people who are, who are recording concerts that they go to their own you know their own recollection of the concert is weaker because they were recording it and it may be that if something similar happens with your daily life if you're recording your daily life then your own experiential memory of your life may become weaker you will have the the digital footage but some would say that you were you were going to be poorer for for not remembering it in an organic manner. So I think there's going to be arguments pro and con on this on this subject. And you can spend half your life like looking back at this more objective version of your life. Yeah, that you actually didn't remember in the moment, right? It's, it's a. I spend a lot of time. I'm very nostalgic, so I spend a lot of time looking back at old videos of my kids. Yeah, I do too. I, but I think the the solution is um, you outsource it, so your experience at the concert, but the little drone flying around is recording it, and then the AI selects the parts of it that are most pleasing to you, or the ones that are most likely to make you stay on your diet or nice to your neighbor. Whatever whatever impact you want, the AI filters the memories and shows you the ones that are likely to have the desired outcome. So so that's our future, Corey. It's it's kind of kind of a kept person phenomenon, right? Well, hey, as long as I'm happy, <laughs> as long as I have the illusion of free will, it's it's everything's good. Um, so, well, I, I actually I, I sort of wonder, like, is that AI going to actually choose the things that will make you happier, or will the AI choose to show you the memories that will make Amazon happier? Yes, you you have to make sure someone you trust wrote the code. Yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna show you things that will increase your purchase yes. of Amazon, which you clearly yes. can't do, right? Yes, uh, yes. I mean, I don't know what Google's motivations are, but I have to say, you know, there's they evil, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> you see the one billion dollar investment Microsoft made in OpenAI. I, I was at OpenAI just a few days ago. You know, it's clear. You know, all I say is whatever they're doing, right? These little kind of herky jerky little animations just pull at your heartstrings, right? It's almost their hokiness is something that makes you just. It's you know I just have this well of emotion spring up when I see my my kids kind of like in three frames. Oh, absolutely, frame. yeah. There's no stronger feeling in the you know I can watch a little clip, ten second clip on my phone of my kids when they were ten or something, and it's like there's nothing more uh, engaging or stirring for me than to actually see that. So, um, you guys are familiar with the experience machine, the Nozick experiment, thought experiment, where you yes. can go in and like have you go into the box yes. and you can have any possible experience you want, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can decide to live in the box. Exactly, yeah, and it turns out that men have a much greater ten- inclination to live in the box than women do. But, but I think you're really getting to a point where you have a chance to relive your past very, very concretely, perhaps even with sort of more sensory experience. And it's 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 going to be hard to resist the sort of pleasant moments of it, especially as you get older. Okay, let's get back on track because uh, we might be running low on time. Um, so one of the topics we wanted to discuss was varieties of parallel universes, and let me just list two. One is where you go to the parallel universe and the very laws of physics are different, like the mass of the hydrogen atom or the proton could be different in the other universe, or there's no electromagnetism in the other universe. And that's actually a potential possibility that string theory suggests because there are different vacuum states of string theory in which the physical laws are different. So that's one thing that physicists have looked at recently. The one that uh, you actually, I think, referenced in the story that you mentioned where there's lots of envy is I think the many worlds quantum mechanics version of parallel universes, which by the way, I do work on many worlds quantum mechanics. And I think most people would be surprised to learn that among theoretical physicists, uh, particularly the ones who think about cosmology and string theory and things like that, I think there are more many worlds believers than there are not. That, that many worlds might be close to the majority opinion, at least among certain subsets of physicists, uh, for the right interpretation of quantum mechanics. And and so in many worlds, quantum mechanics, every quantum event that could go either way, so for example, I'm doing an experiment and I might observe that the spin of this particle is up, or I might observe that the spin of the particle is down, rather than just one of those outcomes being realized, actually both are realized But because I see them in my conscious brain and it causes a macroscopic rearrangement of my memories, two different branches of the universe are created and can, in a sense, no longer talk to each other or have very minimal interference with each other uh, in which the different outcomes are realized. So essentially, all possible outcomes are realized. And there's a Corey that uh, went to law school instead of uh, business school, instead of philosophy grad school. And so these different Coreys can wonder about each other and be envious of each other. In the story, Anxiety is the Dizziness of Freedom, it is based on the many worlds interpretation. 
And But I think with regard to the sort of uh, example that you gave, Steve, it's important to note that it is not so simple that uh, of observing like the spin state of a subatomic particle leading to a person making a, one decision or another. Some people have argued that there is some kind of quantum am- amplifier in our brains where quantum uncertainty gives rise to neural processes which may affect our decision making. I personally uh, am completely unconvinced of that. I think that, I mean, it's not impossible, but I see no reason to think that right now. I think that any causal chain between some quantum event and a human decision is going to be much, much longer. And it will not be the result of any quantum event that actually took place within the particles of your brain. It will be the result of some quantum event elsewhere in the Earth's atmosphere, which led to different atmospheric conditions, which led to different, slightly different events in your life. And then down the line, that may result in you actually making a different decision. Yes. But it'll be quite a long causal chain between the two. Yes. What, what you've described is the conventional picture of how this all works. There's a guy called Roger Penrose and others who have advocated that perhaps direct quantum mechanics is, quantum mechanics is directly related to f- important functioning of your brain. Almost nobody believes that, actually. Um, the functioning of your brain seems to be largely classical physics. And so the way that this quantum yes, yes. indeterminism would amplify in order to influence your decisions is through these much more lo- much longer causal chains of events involving lots of different particles and different outcomes, which is why I think, going back to our discussion of free will, very few people think that quantum mechanics has a particularly large impact on the earlier purely classical analysis of free will that we discussed. With regard to our brains, a huge gaping hole in understanding is consciousness. We virtually understand nothing about consciousness. And so I think to, you know, predetermine that it's not quantum may be a little bit yeah, ahead that, of schedule, given that right. we actually don't understand anything that, about the phenomenon No itself. one's saying that uh, they understand, yeah, no one's saying they really fully understand consciousness, just saying that what appears to be like uh, the important uh, actions in your brain, like the firing of a neuron, sure, sure. that Action involves potential. so many particles and appears to not be coherent. Uh, there's this technical term there. Uh, coherent in a quantum mechanical sense that it's hard to imagine that uh, it's more than uh, classical physics, actually, that's determining the firing that neuron. I actually found the argument that, to put it bluntly, it's the it's the weather dummy that matters, right? To be fairly compelling, your argument, as I take it, is that there are these very small quantum changes, but they effectively propagate through effects on the weather. Small changes cause small perturbations in, ox- in the collision of oxygen atoms, nitrogen atoms, other things in the atmosphere, and these propagate outward in very unpredictable ways. And just to take the example you give, all this you need is a very, very subtle effect on the human body to have an effect on who's born in the next generation. Yes. but So first of all, I agree with your observation, but there is weather in your brain too, right? In the sense that there are random fluctuations of stuff. But I think to me, the most sort of accurate caricature of how this free will argument should take place is that because of quantum mechanics, there is perhaps some kind of almost true randomness in the universe. Um, But if you're a mostly classical robot living in a universe where occasionally there is randomness, like there are coin flips happening outside of you, maybe occasionally inside of you, that doesn't mean that you have free will. That's right. It means that you're still a mostly classical robot living in a universe with some random. No, this was sort of an explanation as to how you got these very, very different outcomes occurring by a small... Yes. Perturbation. yes, and that is what, in the many worlds interpretation, does allow for a universe where Corey went to law school, Corey became a professional football player. <laughs> it does allow for those things on some of the branches to be realized. Although I'm, I'm just going to interject that just because you are a classical robot doesn't mean you don't have free will, because yes. that's, that's the whole compatibilism argument. Right, right. I was just saying that it doesn't change our earlier discussion. The fact that there is quantum mechanics probably doesn't change the nature of our earlier discussion on compatibilism. Yes, yes, I agree. And it's also worth pointing out that I think the desire to attribute consciousness in some part to quantum mechanics is maybe a reflection of people's desire, what what has sometimes been called the, the minimization of mystery, that 
quantum mechanics is, is mysterious and consciousness is mysterious. And so maybe these two mysterious things are actually the same thing because that would kind of reduce the amount of mystery in the universe. But I don't actually find that a compelling argument for quantum mechanics playing a significant role in consciousness. Yeah, they're actually mysterious in different ways. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think it seems very implausible to me that quantum mechanics plays an important role in consciousness. Now, the, the other direction, the arrow in the other direction has been advocated because the person observing the spin of the particle as it comes out of the detector is a conscious person. And so people have posited that somehow quantum mechanics depends on the interaction between the spin of this little particle and the consciousness observing it. That's the sort of Borean, Mysterian view that the, the consciousness collapses the wave function of the electron. And that view, I think, fewer and fewer physicists uh, are sympathetic to. But at the time when quantum mechanics was new, there were a lot of people who thought uh, in that way. Yes, yes. But yeah, I, I am also unpersuaded about that. Yeah, uh, I'm not either. I mean, when you just dig into the phenomena, I don't want to go a huge digression with conscious, but the phenomenon you're having a hard time explaining the consciousness is just a very different phenomenon than a kind of constrained randomness you have in quantum mechanics, right? It's they, they, they may be non-causal, at least appear to be non-causal in the same way, but there's not a sense of qualia, qualitative experiences you get with consciousness. There's not a sense of a non-random control under some sort of guidance you have a consciousness, none of that appears in quantum mechanics. So you're kind of re reducing one thing to something that looks very unlike it. That just makes the reduction well, look impossible. I think one of the new pieces of information we'll get in the next, who knows, few decades maybe on this question is whether you could evolve an AI which has a sense of self and uh, act, you know, self, maybe self-preservation action, things like this, but which doesn't have qualia. So maybe qualia are just a side effect of evolving an AI that needs to care for itself and have some internal state or thought about itself, and you just then get qualia as a side effect. Question or, is, how would you know whether this thing has qualia or not? Well, you could ask it. You could, hey, do you feel qualia? Yeah, I'm really here. I feel. Don't yeah, turn me off. Don't touch that switch. You couldn't tell, of course, whether you evolved the tendency to say a qualia or had qualia itself, right? You couldn't tell the difference between... Right. It, you could It's self-report. Or maybe you could measure something. But uh, anyway... There is the argument that we rely on self-report with other people, and you know we we, we we think that's we think that's that's sufficient. We believed that other human beings had qualia uh, long before we had any you know fMRI scanning equipment. So I think there is an argument to, to be made that if a piece of software's behavior was as rich and varied as a human being's, that there'd be no good reason to doubt its self-report any more than we have any reason to doubt other pe people's self-reported experiences. Well, Searle would disagree, as you know. Uh, yes, uh, Searle would disagree. Right. I think Searle is completely, completely wrong. But maybe, but his argument, I think, merits consideration, which is whether it's actually the material that matters, whether it's the physical realization rather than the behavior or the, as, just, as people like to say, the functional characterization that matters to consciousness. And that's, I'm a little agnostic here because I can't tell you to ever resolve this question. Uh, and, and Searle's view, we attribute consciousness to other people in large part because they're built to the same stuff that we are. But if you're built to something, take you know, in your story, Exhale, right? If you're built of uh, a kind of series of kind of hydraul a hydraulic system involving gold plates, uh, very, very thin gold plates and small air canisters, I think it, there's an incredible emotional tendency, much like our emotional tendency to think we have free will to attribute consciousness to such a being. I, I, I'd say ultimately be agnostic about, about it because you can't prove one way or the other whether this being has con I can't prove that, you know, Steve here is conscious, but, you know, he looks a lot like me from the inside as far as I could tell. Yeah, but you can't prove that we aren't living in a simulation and you guys are all game characters and I'm the only player character in the game, right? We'll never be able to refute that. Again, emo an emotional tendency, right, which more or less is very similar to free will. So I think these are questions that are many ways. I it's hard for me to figure out we're going to go one way in free will and go another way in these questions when they seem ultimately based on the same kind of uh, uh, weak evidential basis. There is also the argument that the fact that you are relying on, you know, sort of a physical similarity between Steve and you is a kind of, you know, prejudice you have a prejudice against beings which don't resemble you. And 
that you know really you should judge a conscious being by the content of their character not their physical appearance <laughs> and if a conscious being its behavior is as rich and varied as that of another human being it is perhaps only prejudice which is preventing you from granting it the same benefit of the doubt that you grant other human beings again i'm i'm close to being agnostic on this point but but if we go down this road right <laughs> Uh, the requiring their behaviors like mine is also a form of prejudice. And so you could take a position, which is that there's gradations of consciousness all the way down to quarks. And the more complex behavior you exhibit, the more and more consciousness you have. So this takes us to a kind of position that Christoph Koch apparently is now advocating, which is consciousness goes all the way down to the bottom, the smallest particles, and that you simply get higher levels of consciousness as these begin to organize and exhibit more complex behavior. So I think that's also a possible position, and I can't see how you would rule that out or rule out any of the others. That's that's why I think it's a, you know, that's where I think, that, that I think is the argument for a kind of strong agnosticism on consciousness, because it seems to be driven by biases between positions you actually can't come to any objective conclusion about unless we have some radical new physics that allows us essentially to measure consciousness. And maybe that'll come at some point. Uh, right. Current physics doesn't allow it. I think at some level, you'll never ant- you'll never get past the basic questions like the simulation question. So no matter how much our science advances, I still won't be sure that I'm not in a simulation, that you guys could all be uh, game characters in the simulation. So that's the key question. Will there be a physics fundament at some point in time where you can begin to measure consciousness as a quantity? Yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> but let me let, let me switch gears because we're running out of time. So we wanted to discuss Ted's op-ed from the future that appeared in the New York Times. And so um, reading from the New York Times, it says, this is the first installment in a new series, op-eds from the future, in which science fiction writers, futurists, philosophers, and scientists write op-eds that they imagine we might read 10, 20, or even 100 years in the future. And Ted's op-ed was uh, entitled, It's 2059 and the rich kids are still winning. DNA tweaks won't fix our problems. And let me just read the first sentence. Last week, the Times published an article about the long-term results of the Gene Equality Project, the philanthropic effort to bring genetic cognitive enhancements to low-income communities. Sorry, I'll read the second sentence as well. The results were largely disappointing. While most of the children born in the project have now graduated from a four-year college, few attended elite universities, and even fewer have found jobs with good salaries or opportunities for advancement. So this envisions a future where genetic cognitive enhancement is possible. It actually works, but it doesn't fully equalize class inequality. Um, I think, Ted, because your implication is because there are all kinds of environmental benefits that the children of the rich still have access to relative to the poor. But I think in the in your op-ed, you were accepting the fact that one could actually tweak cognitive ability for the uh, underclass and improve it. Is, is that fair? Well, I, I would phrase it this way, that in the piece, I am accepting the idea that it is possible to identify genes and that are associated with intelligence and to engineer children to have you know, more of those genes. But I guess the, the thesis of the piece is that cognitive gene enhancements or genetic cognitive enhancements only provide a benefit if you live in a meritocracy. And if you don't live in a meritocracy, then they are not actually uh, providing a benefit. And we don't live in a meritocracy. Not, I mean, not a full meritocracy. So the fact that people desire genetic cognitive enhancements for their children is a reflection of their belief that we live in a meritocracy. Yes, I understand. And the fact that we don't, I think, is something that may lead to some outcomes that people are not expecting. This may be an academic point, but in the story, though, the universe of the story, the people who got the cognitive advancements do, for example, read better uh, and do arithmetic or algebra better than they would have had they not gotten the genetic enhancements. In other words, they did do something biologically beneficial. Yeah, okay. It's just that society is still highly unfair. Yes. So as I understand your position, Ted, yeah, I think you're you're not saying that it's not. It's completely not a meritocracy. You're not saying it's a full meritocracy. It's somewhere in between. There's some 
statistical contribution to success, which is not dependent upon your abilities and depend upon your privileged status. And it, uh, these kids yes. do a little bit better, but not, uh, you know, not as much as we would like. I'm just curious, wh- wh- what do you think, what do you think is missing? Is it the connections? Because you're really commenting about today's society. Is it the connections? Is it the kind of soft social skills? Is it, um, what is it you think is non-meritocratic about today's society and likely continue to be non-meritocratic? Actually, I think most aspects of our society are probably not meritocratic. I think meritocracy only exists in very narrow contexts in our society. I think there is enormous systemic and structural bias in our society, and th- and these things are going to be very, very difficult to correct. And I think that everyone likes to think that their system is meritocratic. Everyone, want, everyone wants to think that they're choosing people based on their actual skills, their, their actual performance. But you know, there is ample reason to believe that you know, that is not actually the case in almost every aspect of society. You know, it's interesting. I've read two op-eds in the past three or four months. Uh, one was yours, and one was a recent one in the Times, two op-eds in the Times about uh, a black female professor at Yale who decided to ask white guys about white privilege. I think this ran just a couple of days ago. She describes different kinds of experiences, um, being in line in the airport and having a bunch of I, her suggestion is basically a bunch of people of color in line, women, and a bunch of white guys showed up and they'd have to basically stand behind this group if they were to follow the rules, but then they simply created their own line right next to them and then were merged into this existing line. So half of them went ahead of half of the people origi- in the original line. She eventually works up the c- courage to ask one of these guys uh, after she had some pleasant interactions with him about his white privilege and uh, his response was that I've earned everything that I've gotten. I can't remember exactly what she said, but my inclination was she should have said, how do you possibly know that? <laughs> you know, how can you be aware of, uh, you know, you're sure that none of the friends uh, who helped you get jobs weren't motivated by your skin color or your parents' connections might not have helped you in some particular way? It's these kind of, you know, I, I tend to agree with you. There's these kind of things that are often hidden from us because we have a hard time seeing or don't want to see them that have enormous impact. Everyone wants to believe that they earned what they got. No matter how, how much privilege a person has, they are going to say that they deserved what, uh, everything that they got, that they worked for it. I think we can say, did, uh, did George W. Bush work for everything he got? <laughs> Or maybe did he benefit from the fact that he had he came from a, a wealthy and powerful family? George W. Bush would never say, I got it easy. No, George W. Bush is convinced that he worked for everything he got. Everyone is convinced of that. But that is clearly not the case for everyone. I, uh, I want to agree with you that luck plays a huge role in most outcomes, and it's generally not acknowledged by people. Now... I, at the risk of being uh, too pedantic, I want to just give a simple statistical argument, which should be familiar to everyone, but is not. So if, imagine you take a person who is exceptional in some way. It could be that he's a very good basketball player, or it could be he's very smart, or he could be very rich. Let's suppose this person is four standard deviations above average in terms of whatever quality you're measuring for him. The most likely to find a person who is plus four standard deviations on that quality is to find someone who's plus two standard deviations in ability and another plus two standard deviations in luck because both are playing a role and uh, it's much harder to get a plus four fluctuation all in ability or all in luck than to just combine two two standard deviation fluctuations. So plus two standard deviations is a couple of percent probability, but plus four is like one in 30,000 or something like this, 50,000. So basically most people who are above average have a component of their success due to luck and a component uh, due to ability. And same thing for people with very bad outcomes. They might be a little bit below average 
on a characteristic, but then they also were unlucky, conditional on just selecting people that are super, uh, you know, who are in a super bad position in life. So in almost all these cases, there is a hidden component of luck, which just from statistical analysis, you can guess is there in most situations, but people never acknowledge it because they're just not used to thinking this way. So sorry if that was too pedantic. <laughs> now, to come back to Ted's example, one example people had given that may now be forgotten is the contrast was often drawn between um, George Bush and Roger Clinton, who was Clinton, Bill Clinton's half-brother, who had very, very different lives, uh, primarily because uh, George Bush came from a wealthy family and Bill Clinton came from a poor family. And Bill Clinton uh, had some luck, but he also had extraordinary abilities that allowed him to uh, do well. And uh, George Bush did well in spite of not particularly having those skills. But the reason I was particularly struck by Ted's op-ed was not just because Ted is one of my favorite science fiction writers, but also the Times and other people are starting to recognize this idea that there is uh, inequality in genetic luck, that some people do get more genetic luck than others, and that maybe in the future we'll have technologies that allow you to equalize that genetic luck. And then you might even choose as a society to do that. Ted is pointing out that even that is not enough to have uh, equality of outcome at the end. But what struck me as very interesting is a kind of flip-flop between saying genes don't influence anything, it's all environment, to, well, genes do uh, uh, affect some things, and so let's equalize that if we have the technology now. So that seemed like a big jump. Well, I don't think the time is... I don't think anyone's ever said genes don't matter. I mean, just look at like, look, genes affect height, genes affect how you look. Uh, you know, the Times may have been skeptical about genes and intelligence, but they were never skeptical about genes and physical appearance and okay, the power of physical appearance. this article is about intelligence. That's right. Okay. So you're right. I think that's becoming much more mainstream, the, the basic premise that Ted's accepting in this, uh, in this view. Now, here's a question. It's kind of, it's not, it's, it's hidden in the back of your article, but you don't think that having this kind of engineering will equalize things, but it's kind of unstated whether you think it might be a good idea for people to have the opportunity to avail themselves of it if it does improve outcomes in some degree. So I'm curious because, you know, you, you, don't, you don't take a position on that, but you must have thought about this as part of writing the article or otherwise. Would it be, would it be good for society as a whole? Yeah. It's not, it's not clear to me that it's, it would be good for society as a whole. Well, I think the article suggests that it would very likely wind up being sort of another excuse used for inequality, to justify inequality. It would be a way for people to claim that there's a biological basis for the kind of class discrimination or wealth discrimination that they already engage in. So I, I don't know that it would be good for society as a whole. On the other hand, as an outcome of this uh, genetic intervention, you have a lot more people that are capable of doing a good four-year college degree. So in some absolute sense, don't you have a more capable society than you did absent uh, these genetic interventions? Maybe. I suppose if my goal were to get more people to graduate from four-year college, you know, I think you know, my preferred route would be entirely different. It would be thing, things like free college for everyone, which has, has been proposed and is something that you know, a lot of people argue would not be that expensive compared to some of the other things that we spend money on. And you know, I, think that would be, I think that would be a much better way of getting more people to complete a four-year degree. My concern with both of these proposals is actually I think they would probably end up exaggerating inequality given that people are more likely to avail themselves of uh, genetic engineering opportunities are likely to be wealthy and if we keep the current cost structure of college the same and we allow people to go free to places like Yale and Harvard, uh, you already may be favoring people more likely to get into those schools in the first place by having them not have to pay. So we have to like change the – I'm very sympathetic to the free college idea, but you have to change the structure of college costs so you're not simply subsidizing people going to – wealthy people going to wealthy colleges. I think some of the – I don't want to get long – some of the debt forgiveness proposals – are going to wipe out debt for people who are often fairly wealthy. That's that's true. That you know, we would have to have a, a long conversation about the the best way to sort of uh, eliminate college debt or make college accessible to the largest number of people. I believe that the cost of free IVF and free CRISPR 
is way below the cost of the college education, four years of college education for one individual. It's probably about a quarter uh, of the cost. So just throw, just throwing that out there. But, but free IVF or CRISPR to do what exactly, right? Presumably there are hundreds of genes, intelligence, you don't actually know, know the effects you change the genes as we've seen with the current case. So, you know, we're not anywhere close to... No, I meant, I meant in his... this His is science fiction. So this is set in 2059. Okay. So assuming CRISPR gets better, gene mapping gets better, cost of an IVF cycle might be $10,000. Cost of the CRISPR vector might be $20. It's a lot less than four years of tuition at Michigan State or Harvard. Well, then there's the question of what is the goal? Is your goal to sort of increase the number of, sm- of smart people as cheaply as possible? Or is your goal to uh, sort of create a more just society? If, 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 if your goal is like, how do we create more smart people as cheaply as possible? Then yes, like the, there are probably all sorts of ways that we could do that. If your goal is to create a more just society, then I don't, I don't, I don't think genetic cognitive enhancements you know, play a role in that, not, not, or a very, only a very small role. I think it'll have the opposite effect, actually. Well, I think these technologies will, at least in the short run, have the opposite effect. It'll, they'll increase uh, inequality rather than decrease it. The, the question is sort of theoretically in the long run, if you have a you know, wonderful Scandinavian-style government that's progressive and quasi-socialistic could they use the genetic technologies to good end? And it's not clear to me whether that, that's the case, but it's not excluded. Yeah, a Scandinavian-style world government, right? Yeah, world government. Okay. Yeah. The, the Federation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're way over time, Ted. So I, I really appreciate your spending this much time with us. I, I really enjoyed the discussion. I'm sorry we didn't let you talk more. Corey and I got too excited about the topics. <laughs> But uh, it's been great, and uh, we will edit this into something intelligible, I hope, and I think the fans will really enjoy it. This has really been a pleasure, Ted. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I, 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 enjoyed, I enjoyed the conversation. All right. Take care.